Please open your Bibles to John, the first chapter, the Gospel of John, the first chapter. We're looking in, as we study this book, to into what we call the prologue or the introduction of the foreword of the book. And we mentioned those things last week as we approached the study of the book of John. We ought to remind ourselves that with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, then they are written to offer evidence to prove that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. John particularly lets it be known at the end of his book, John 20, 30, 31, why he's writing the book, and that's it, to prove that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. And in the apostles' introduction to his gospel account, he introduces his readers to another man named John who was, of course, called John the Baptist, which means John the Immerser. We learn from verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. So what do we see? This man was sent from God. It's interesting to watch the unfolding of the scheme of redemption as you read through the Old Testament. And we notice that you have all of the various prophecies of the Christ. And yet just before he comes, God had it in his infinite wisdom to send a man especially to prepare the way for Jesus Christ to do the work that he did. So John is no happenstance work, that is John the Baptist. He came, according to verse 7, the same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all men through him, that is the light, might believe. So that's his work, John's work, to bear witness of the light. And in doing so, prepare the Jews to receive their Messiah. What we're understanding as we go into this, or what we're examining really, is uh, what was the place and purpose of John's work on earth. Because God intended him to come, he was sent from God. I think it's interesting to note that's just a simple statement that John was sent from God. It doesn't go into the details of how he was sent from God. It doesn't mention the fact of his mother being past time to have children, and yet she did. And that was the way John, as a human being, came into the world. It was through the law of procreation. And yet, it's like Abraham, they were past the age of doing such things, but nevertheless, it transpires. I don't think there's any miracle here at all. (laughs) It's just a matter that God intervened in natural things and providence and brought it all about. But he was sent from God. How was he sent from God? Well, he was born into the world, as any one of us was conceived and born into the world. So just because it says there was a man sent from God doesn't mean there had to be a miracle worked. Because when God's laws on this earth are followed, then that's God doing it. Uh, Where does gravity come from, God? Why does it still work? God wills it to work. And the same with anything that pertains to this present world and the things that are invisible, and that is the spiritual world. So he came and was sent from God, and he was to bear witness of that light. We sang a moment ago in his song about the light. Light and truth is always synonymous when it comes to these things. Darkness is always synonymous with ignorance of God's Word. But not only in John 1 verse 8 does the Apostle John make it clear that the other John John the baptizer, was not the light. But he states it again in verses 19 through 20 of this same chapter. That is the purpose of John's work. We might ask the question, why did John the Baptist bear witness of the light? Verse 7 tells us, that's the reason I mentioned it just a second ago, that he might bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. Well, lo and behold, according to John 20, the Apostle John writing, verses 30 and 31, to which we've mentioned several times or referred to, this is the exact same reason that the Apostle John wrote the Gospel account. 
So you see a compounding of things happening, all caused by God, directed by God, so that man is without excuse. There was no Jew who lived in that day that had any excuse for rejecting Jesus Christ of Nazareth as Messiah. No Jew. They had all of the prophecies. They had the law of Moses, a schoolmaster to bring them unto Christ, Galatians 3.24. They had John specifically sent a man among men, one of theirs, and he bore all the marks of a prophet of old, such as Elijah. Before John the Baptist came as a forerunner of the light, we know then, as I've said a couple of times, that others came before him. They spoke and they wrote of the coming Christ, the anointed one. Now, since our Lord's return to heaven, then it's the divine obligation of the spiritual body of Christ, the church. Yea, indeed, it's a privilege, but an obligation too. To declare Jesus Christ to the world is the only solution to man's sin problem, the greatest problem man has. The light of the world. Of course, as we know, as you study through the scriptures, that that light that brings salvation to man is the gospel light. And we sing an old song, sin the light, the blessed gospel light. It's God's power to save us from sin, Romans 1.16. That sort of ties back in and as far as talking about since John was sent from God, but he came through natural procreative process. Well, the same is true when God makes us Christians, and God does. But it's through the instrumentality of the Word, the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8.11, and our believing it and obeying it. But nevertheless, God made me a Christian. There's nobody that is a Christian to use that term as it's defined and used in the New Testament that God didn't make one. So, we're interested in this because God is so interested in it. Whatever God is interested in, seems to me His children ought to be interested in the same thing. Maybe some of us remember as we were children or even our own children or grandchildren. You'll be doing something and a little one walk up and say, what are you doing? And you'll begin to try to explain it and they'll have all sorts of other questions built upon that as to what you're doing. Well, why? Because they're interested in what their father's doing or their mother, as the case may be. They're interested. And maybe they can't understand exactly what's happening. They're not mature enough to do so. But they're interested. And you try to explain certain things to them as they're able to understand. And so we as God's children should be, ought to be, and will be interested in those things that belong to God. And that are our responsibility. And we'll meditate on them day and night. We will not say, oh, who cares? That's a sign of something else. Before John, then I said that others had declared of our Lord's coming. And that takes us back to what we've already mentioned, we all know, and that's the Old Testament prophets. They foretold of the sufferings of Jesus Christ and the glories that were to follow. Listen to Peter as he wrote to Christians in 1 Peter 1, 10 and 11, concerning the prophets and concerning the scheme of redemption that God had ordained. He says, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. There's a lot in that verse, but it tells us just how much was going on in those prophecies and the prophets themselves desire to understand even their own prophecies, trying to figure out the time that all these things would take place. The prophet Isaiah wrote these words. We're familiar with it in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. 
Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. You'll see that Matthew, in writing about the birth of Christ, will refer back by inspiration's guidance to Matthew, or rather uh, Isaiah 7, 14, and say it's fulfilled in the birth of Jesus Christ. Now, there have been some people go to Isaiah 7, 14 because of the first uh, edition of the Revised Standard Version back in the late 40s, early 50s, that translated Isaiah 7, 14, talking about uh, he'd give them a sign and then said a, a young maid shall conceive. Well, I'd like to know how that's a sign. That's what young maids have been doing for ever. That's not a sign. But a virgin conceiving, no man involved, is certainly a sign. And uh, they'll say, well, the Hebrew word Alma, which is translated uh, virgin, that can be translated a young maid. But you know, God settled that for us. Because Matthew used a Greek word that can only be translated virgin, and he quoted this, Isaiah 7, 14. And that settles it for anybody that's honest and that receives the Bible as the very word of God. So the Holy Spirit gave, gives us a divine commentary on virgin, regardless of the generic possibilities of the Hebrew that's translated virgin. In Greek it didn't. It meant a virgin and nothing else. But now watch, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and, and peace there shall be no end, upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this, chapter 9, 6, and 7. And then from that same great prophet Isaiah, we find from chapter 53 of the suffering servant, these words in verses 4 through 6, speaking of the coming virgin-born Messiah, Surely hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Again, 53, 4, and 6. Micah, who worked about the same time Isaiah did, had this to say. And we noted it last week. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come he, he, he come forth, shall he come forth unto me, that is to be the ruler of Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from of old, from everlasting. It's been estimated, and frankly, I've never sat down personally and done it, but that there are some 300 prophecies in the Old Testament concerning Jesus Christ. Jesus fulfilled every one of them in his earthly ministry and pertaining to his life and all he did to save us from our sins. The Jews were without excuse. Not only did they have those prophecies over a period of hundreds of years come to them about the Messiah, but then it's almost like God says, Jesus Christ is the Messiah, period, and John the Baptist is the period. <laughs> he had a special forerunner come before him to announce that Christ is coming and that the kingdom of God is at hand. And Jesus reminded his disciples of this truth. We won't go into detail, but you'll remember the following his resurrection. The two disciples on the road to Emmaus, Luke 24, 25 through 27. That's one of those places that you would yearn to have wished to have been there. 
for it talks about how as they went along that he opened up all those prophecies of the scriptures and showed their fulfillment in the Son of God. That, wouldn't that be amazing? That Jesus would take those very things that through the Holy Spirit spoke of him when he was still in heaven and then explain them. How did they all fit? In Luke 24, 44 through 47, he did the same thing with his apostles in Jerusalem. There was so much done just over and over and over again, coming at it from one way or the other, so that they were out of excuse. And the fact of the matter is, in view of, the, of what's in the Bible, for our learning, we are without excuse. John the Baptist was foretold himself by the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3, Isaiah spoke of him in this way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the deserts a highway for our God. What we don't understand is that when the old oriental monarchs would travel through the kingdom, they all had someone to go well enough ahead of them to announce that the king will be coming through this village or this area and that the people there would have time to prepare for his coming. I guess we could say they had time to put their best foot forward to get things straightened up. Thus, when you find John preaching to get the Jews ready for their Messiah, he said, repent ye. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, they knew they couldn't have a kingdom without a king. So the king is coming. Repent ye. Well, how did they repent? They still approached God under the law of Moses. They repented of not living like they were supposed to under it. And repented for all those things. They resolved to be particular that they were in harmony with it and their conduct. That's how they got ready for him. You'll remember at various times when Jesus would heal somebody. He would tell, such as a leper, he would tell them, you go and do what Moses said about showing this to the priest. They were still under the law of Moses. It was still the way the Jew approached God, and that's where he did his work, under the law of Moses. So they had time to prepare. They had specific instructions that the king is coming. And... He's identified, as you read through the other gospel accounts, by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew 3, 1 through 3. Mark 1, verses 1 through 4. And Luke 3, verses 1 through 6. Thus, John baptized with the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. When the Jew repented of not living, as the law said, in getting ready for the king, then he would prove his belief that John was telling the truth about the king coming by being baptized for the remission of those sins. Now, the Apostle John informs us regarding how John the Baptist bore witness of the light. If you read through the account of John doing his work, he was out there in the wilderness. The people went out to him. Did you notice that? Now, he was somebody I don't know that we would want to approach all too easily. And the way that he looked... He was not a person that looked like you'd like to invite him home for supper. He wore a girdle of camel's hair. And he ate locusts and wild honey. Well, that wasn't as far-fetched to people of that time than we might think, but he lived out there in the wilderness. And he was so much of a drawing power that the people went out to him. You hear what he had to say. And that says something about the state of mind of the people of that time concerning Messiah. If you read secular history, the people were looking for a Messiah. They knew enough. They, they just didn't understand the particulars. And they were very much aware of these things. So they were looking. Thus, you'll find somebody saying, we found Jesus of Nazareth, of whom the prophet spoke. Well, they would know that they hadn't read the prophets and believed it to be the word of God and note the signs. And you see that kind of thing. So they went out to listen. They were a prophet-oriented people. They hadn't had a prophet in years and years and years. 
and the people believed him to be a prophet. You'll remember that uh, chief priests and others were scared of John in dealing with him in a harsh way because the people believed him to be a prophet. And they knew they'd get the people after him if they tried to deal with him the wrong way. The prophets foretold the coming of Jesus. And John pointed directly to Jesus before he began his ministry. When Jesus was there, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. John 1, 29 and verses 35 through 36. In John 1 and verse 34, the Son of God. And during the time of Jesus' work on earth, another bore witness of Jesus as the light. Maybe we don't really, we know it, but we don't think that much about it. You know who that was? It was God the Father. For he testified of the deity of his Son. He did it because the, the Son had the Holy Spirit without measure. John 5, 36 through 37 in chapter 10, verse 25, as well as verses 37 through 38. And so many other places, Jesus did miracles for a given purpose. So the people would know he was who he claimed to be. And thus, when Nicodemus came to him by night, he said, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these things except God be with him. As Nicodemus said then, And one who he healed, a man born blind, so declared in John 9, 32 through 33. He also bore witness through his voice from heaven. You remember at the baptism of Jesus? The Father said, speaking directly from heaven, This is my beloved Son, and whom I am well pleased, Matthew 3, 16 through 17. Then later at the Mount of Transfiguration, when Peter was being old magnanimous, well-meaning Peter, and there had been the transfiguration of Jesus, Moses, and Elijah, he said, Oh, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let's build three tabernacles, one to Moses, one to Elijah, and one to you. And the voice Settle that matter right directly from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. But he added something here he didn't add the first time. Hear ye him. But also, we don't consider this one this much. At Jerusalem, during the last week of his time here on earth, the following happened. John 12, verses 27 through 30. The Father's doing it, and listen. Jesus says, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Now watch you. Father, glorify thy name. Now listen. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said, an angel spake to him. But now listen to what Jesus says. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes, and still for our sake. The Father speaking up and recorded in words that there the last week on earth, he says, this is my son. And we mentioned this morning that God bore witness through raising Jesus from the dead. So he declared Jesus to be the son of God with power, Romans 1, 3, and 4. But he also, in declaring that, made it clear that he would be the one to judge the world. John 12, verse 48. But especially when Paul is preaching in Athens, in the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, in that he hath raised him from the dead. 
Well, we ought to preach the same way today, shouldn't we? Isn't that part of the gospel? In part, the apostle Peter said of Christ, Him God raised up the third day and showed Him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us, Peter writes, who did eat and drink with Him after He rose from the dead. And He commanded us to preach unto the people, and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to judge the quick, that is the living, and the dead. Now watch what he says about the prophets. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, that's by his authority, whosoever, nobody left out, believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Acts 10, 40, 43. Now, this is from the conversion of Cornelius. And when God, directly from heaven, had placed his stamp on these uncircumcised Gentiles, that they have a right to be Christian, just like you Jews. And he did so by giving them miraculous powers to speak in tongues. Peter said simply, Can any man forbid water that he should not be baptized? And they did baptize them. So I know the believing here meant obedient believers. Nevertheless, God bore witness of Christ through the resurrection of the dead as we studied this morning. Then what about among the followers, the disciples of Christ, the members of the Lord's church, those who believed and obeyed the gospel? Well, first of all, let's consider those in a transition those who were Jews that were called to be apostles, the ambassadors of the court of heaven, the witnesses of Christ, who went from under law of Moses to being in the church. They bore witness through what we would say is eyewitness testimony. In this, then they were selected to be special witnesses. John 15, 27, Acts 1, 8. 5 verses 30 and 32 and chapter 13 verses 30 and 31. I might pause here and emphasize that when you're reading John in chapters 13, 14 and 15, even into 16, most of that is a private intimate conversation of Christ with the apostles regarding their work when he goes back to heaven and who's going to take his place. It's not much of it, general comments of the Holy Spirit's work with every member of the church. It is the special work he did with these witnesses, the apostles. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he shall guide you into all things. He shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he has shown, that shall he speak. He's the revealer of God's will. He's the confirmer of God's will. And thus the early church understood that about the place of the apostles, for they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine in the fellowship, breaking of bread and in prayers. So they could provide empirical evidence, 1 John 1, 1 through 2, and 2 Peter 1, 16 through 18. They could work miracles, all nine of them listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, plus one, lay hands on members of the church and impart a gift to them. So they bore witness through their lives. Oh, but they bore witness also in their deaths. Enduring great hardship for their testimony of Christ. 1 Corinthians 4, 9 through 13, as we mentioned this morning. This gave credence to the truthfulness of their testimony that they were willing to suffer even unto death rather than to recant what they had seen with their eyes. As to use John's terminology in 1 John 1, and handle with their hands. It was eyewitness testimony. They weren't going to go back on it. Today in the church, Christians testify to the deity of Christ, but how do they do it? I've never seen Christ, and you haven't either. It helps us understand what a witness is. And a witness gives testimony. Based on what? Solely on what he witnessed with his empirical, with his uh, five senses, his empirical knowledge. So a witness is one who can testify to that which one has seen, heard, and otherwise personally experienced. Not a soul today who can stand up and say, let me give you my testimony that Christ is the Son of God. That holds nothing to me. And it shouldn't to you. 
It's like a fellow said one time, you can't work a miracle. No, but I can sure read you miracles all through the inspired volume. And so it is. Today it's obvious that no person can witness to Christ, as did the apostles of Jesus Christ. So what are Christians to do? Well, listen to this concerning what witnesses, what testimony God has on this earth to give evidence that Christ is the Son of God. Jesus said, and this was when he was giving signs preceding the destruction of Jerusalem, and then after he moved from that, he went into things pertaining to the end of the world. Here's what he said. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. Listen, for a witness unto all nations, Matthew 24 and 14. There's a witness. That's why you're commanded to preach the gospel to every creature. It's the gospel that unfolds the evidence that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. Because the people who wrote that gospel were inspired by the Holy Spirit. They were apostles of Christ. Or they were prophets like Luke and James and Mark. The stamp of divine approval was upon them. Thus the gospel is God's power to save men from sin. Romans 1 verse 16. That's why into our hands is the gospel given. Thus Christians today should know it and live it, preach it and defend it. It is the evidence that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. And you can see even uh, in the days of the apostles what they preached. If you look to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, notice how Paul begins that chapter as we have it in our Bibles. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain, what did he preach? For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. You see, he received it by revelation. He tells the Galatian church, he's in Galatians 1, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, to whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. What does that tell us about what we can preach? Can we preach that? Well, we can. But when I preach it, in fact, not only we can, we better. But I can't preach as I've seen Christ. Nobody's seen Christ. Paul's saying, I preach the gospel to you. Even though he could say, I've seen Christ. And he did. But you say, well, where's the evidence for Christ? We'll disprove what Paul said. Why should I not believe him? Why should I not believe Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Give me reasons, true reasons, that I should not believe what they said. There were thousands that did and died rather than deny it. These Corinthians had never seen what Paul saw or any of the apostles saw. But he says, you stand in the gospel message. You know it's from heaven and not from men. He'll say that in 2 Corinthians 12, 12. For the signs of an apostle were wrought among you. You can take my word to the heavenly bank and prepare to stand in judgment in the light of it. That's why we're to preach the gospel. So when I stand up today and say, let me give you my Christian witness, all I'm doing is saying what I have to tell you that Christ has done for me is better than what Paul said, is better than what Peter said, is better than what the New Testament of Christ said. Now how can that be today? For they actually experienced Christ. And that's exactly what John knew. And I'll just go there for a moment. That's the point John is making. And Paul could have, any apostle could have written this. In 1 John chapter 1, he tells us why he wrote this epistle. And he says that which was from, it sounds like him in John, the gospel. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard. Who can say that today? which we have seen with our eyes, who can say that today? 
which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. Then parenthetically he says, For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. Can I preach that? I sure can. I can preach just exactly what John said, what Paul said, what Matthew said. Because they wrote by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. For all scriptures given by inspiration of God, and they wrote scripture. So the witness of John the Baptist, the forerunner of the Christ, is backed up by all of these others. There are many other things that would contribute to to upholding the gospel message. One of them is the unity of the church. That happens not witness, but it declares people believe the gospel story well enough to abide by the authority of Christ, and that's what joins us together. Jesus was sent by God. God loves the people of the world. And Jesus died for all those in the world. And his record is here. And it's true, and we can preach it. Well, as we bring the lesson to a close, what can we say? Those in the past faithfully bore witness of the light. The forerunner, the prophets, and especially just before he came, John the Baptist. We today preach the gospel, and it bears witness of Christ. That's what we must do. And I close with these verses in 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the facts of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. In Ephesians 5, 8, he says of those brethren in Ephesus, For ye were once darkness, but now you are light in the world. And here's the admonition we all must remember as members of the church. It's what he said then. Walk as children of light. That is, whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by him, Colossians 3.17. If you're not a Christian, we all know here what to do to become a Christian. If as a child of God you sin, your life, maybe during the week, has brought reproach upon this blood-bought body of Christ that you became a member of when you obeyed the gospel. Well, we ask of you to humbly repent of those sins and confess them and pray God forgiveness. Whatever your spiritual need is, then we ask you to come to Christ while we stand.